Sorry. Well, all right. Well, welcome everybody to our third and final virtual meetup of 2020. Um, this has been probably the most requested topic um, when we did the survey a few months back. So I'm really excited to work with uh, Dr. Grimm and Frenetta Copeland from Averbio to bring you this presentation. Uh, just a few little housekeeping things before we get started. Um, this is, like I said, the third uh, of the series. The Cystinosis Basics with Dr. Greenbaum and last week's Cystinosis and Mental Health sessions were both recorded. So if you missed them or, you know, if you didn't have a chance to make it and you want to see see the content and see the discussions, they'll be available soon. This is also being recorded, so if you are unable to stay for the full meeting or if you know someone you think would really like this topic that maybe didn't register or didn't know about it, um, will also be posted as well. And like I said, I'm really excited that we have Dr. Grimm and Fernanda here with us today. We're going to give us a really rich conversation on the future of cystinosis. With, you know, cystinosis basics, we kind of talked about the past and our historical knowledge and what we know. With the mental health, we're kind of talking more about the future and how we manage. And now we're talking about the future for uh, cystinosis families and what kind of hope there is out there. Couple disclaimers, you know, we're going to be talking about medical things. Um, always consult your doctors, you know, if there's any, you know, research that's discussed or possible treatments, talk to your doctors, talk to your healthcare team. It's, uh, it's always important that you understand this is just some advice we can share with you, um, but work with the people that are working with you. And as you guys know, we are using Zoom. Zoom is not a HIPAA compliant platform, so anything you share, you know, also, because we're recording, you know, keep keep patient identifiers out of there, you know, names, ages, specifics, um, because you really don't want to broadcast it to the entire world. So when you do put your questions into the chat, kind of make them more generalized as opposed to directly to your situation. And I will be monitoring the chat. Um, and honey, yes, you are on mute. So uh, if you guys have questions, please use the chat feature at the bottom. I'm going to be moderating the chat at the end of these sessions. And we will have a, you know, you'll have plenty of opportunity to ask your questions and our speakers can probably go into more details of certain things that you are hearing. So at any time, whether it's during the presentation, at the end of the presentation, just feel free to put your chat in. All right. And we've got Christy. So I'm going to introduce Christy Greeley, who is the Executive Director of the Cystinosis Research Network for many, many years, who has done tremendous things for the cystinosis community. Um, and uh, who I've had the pleasure of working with, gosh, for at least six, seven, eight years at this point by now. Um, so Christy, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight and sharing. Sure. Yeah, my pleasure. Sorry I was a little late. Technical oh, you're good. Pace way of the world these days. So I just, uh, I just wanted to welcome everyone to, um, to our last virtual meetup. Um, I want to thank Dr. Graham and Fernanda for joining us today and giving us an update on what's going on uh, in the cystinosis research world. But I want to give a very quick uh, update on, um, or, or sort of overview on what cystinosis research network is, what we do. You know, for the many of you probably, you know, haven't been to a family conference and haven't seen Sort of the, the breadth and depth of what we're involved with. So I thought I'd give a little bit of a, an intro to that before Dr. Grimm and Fernanda get going with their presentation. Um, so generally, Cystinosis Research Network was uh, formed in 1996. I joined in about 2001 after my son Jack, who's now 20, was diagnosed with cystinosis. And uh, I've had uh, a variety of positions within the organization, uh, VP of Research, and then President and currently Executive Director. Um, our vision is the acceleration of the discovery of a cure, development of improved treatments, and enhancement of quality of life for those with cystinosis. And uh, everyone should know we're a volunteer nonprofit organization made up mostly of uh, individuals with cystinosis, parents, and grandparents. And uh, we're dedicated to advocating and providing financial support for research, providing fa family assistance, and educating the, the public and medical communities about cystinosis. Next slide, Gary. So how does CRN fit in? As you're probably aware, there are lots and lots of different cystinosis groups, both in the US and around the world. Um, I have a list of them here. It's not inclusive or, but, um, or, or completely comprehensive, but, but these are, there, as you can see, there, there are cystinosis foundations in generally most countries 
where cystinosis exists. There's also something called Cystinosis Network Europe, and that's a consortium sort of of cystinosis groups uh, around Europe that work together, sort of advance the cause of cystinosis uh, worldwide. And, and Cystinosis Research Network, and we individually um, work uh, with Cystinosis Network Europe, and, and we partner on several different initiatives. Next slide, Carrie. We also partner with a variety of rare disease organizations. You can see there are lots of umbrella groups and, and for those new to the community, an umbrella group is a group that really has to do with um, all rare diseases. In, in Europe, it's something called Euroridus. Um, and there's a community advisory board that the Cystinosis Network Europe um, is in charge of running. And it, it's sort of a venue where industry and academic partners can sort of vet ideas and, and you know, get input from a whole variety of stakeholders, you know, from around the world. Um, there's lots of different other organizations listed here who some of you might be interested in or in checking out or uh, familiar with what they do, Global Genes, NORD, Every Life Foundation, the NIH, of course, and then more specific kidney organizations. And so the takeaway from the slide is just so you know that the CRN uh, partners with all of these groups. The next slide, Gary. In addition, of course, we have pharmaceutical partners and industry that we partner with. Uh, we're lucky to have a lot of treatments for a disease that only has about 600 people in the US. Verizon, of course, manufactures per Sisby, Lediant, uh, Cisteran, Myelin, um, Cystagon, Avrobio is working on gene therapy uh, treatment for stenosis. Recordati recently had Cystadrops approved in the US. And then uh, Alliance uh, RX Walgreens Prime is one of the um, specialty pharmacies that dis distributes some of our drugs. So uh, again, CRN is very interested in collaborating with all of these stakeholders and it's important for us that uh, our community is involved in all of these spaces. Next slide, Carrie. So CRN is made up of a board of directors, an executive committee, um, and then we have the advice of a scientific review board, Medical Professional Advisory Committee, and then we have various in, um, individuals within the community that volunteer their time on different uh, committees. Next slide. So our current executive committee consists of uh, Clinton Moore, who is in his second term as our president. Um, myself is um, executive director and VP of research. We have a newly um, uh, new addition to our executive committee, and that's Jonathan Dix as our VP of development. Our VP of Education and Awareness is Mary Beth Kremenacher. Family Support is Jen Wyman. And then Treasurer Jenny Sextone and Secretary Ina Gardner. Our directors, I see list, you see listed here. And this is a, a, an example of um, sort of a assortment of individuals with cystinosis, uh, parents, and grandparents um, of individuals living with cystinosis. So we try to keep a good variety of people on our, on our board. Uh, so we also can't do without our consultants. As I mentioned before, we're an all-volunteer organization. Um, there's lots of skill sets that we don't have uh, within our, or that we don't have the bandwidth to, um, to take on the, the sort of activities that we have going on. And so we have a great group of consultants, including Carrie, uh, who's here, who helps us with lots of different events. Um, some of you may have seen her present at our family conference last summer in Philadelphia. So we're thankful to have them. Next slide, Carrie. Our key areas of focus for CRN are research, development, otherwise known as fundraising, family support, and education and awareness. And, and these, um, these webinars are sort of an example of, of one of our educational initiatives. I won't go into all of these because I want to leave time for Dr. Graham and Fernanda to talk, but um, this just gives you some idea of some of the scope of, of what our research activities are. And I'm in charge of that, so if you ever have any questions, you can reach out to me. Next slide, Carrie. Uh, our scientific review board um, is in place and they're the ones who uh, review um, proposals that we receive um, usually every year for in, during our call for proposals. And CRN is re has, has, um, has funded millions of dollars in research and, and we're very proud of that. We have another call for proposals that we're in the midst of reviewing right now. And um, you know, we've contributed to some of the research that, that we'll hear about tonight and, and we support it uh, and we're happy to do so. Next slide, Carrie. This is a listing of uh, the individuals that um, we are um, very happy to have uh, assisting us on our medical and professional advisory boards. Um, we, have, we have contact with lots of other individuals, including Dr. Grimm, who um, very generously gives up his time to assist the, the, the community and, and you know, um, 
in providing information and, and sort of helping us digest, especially research related uh, information, which we'll hear about later. Next slide, Gary. In terms of development, I think it's important to note that Sierra Vision has raised over $7 million since its inception. So that, that money has gone to research, it's gone to family support. We have a, a, a family conference that takes place every other year. We're hoping to have one in person uh, in 2021 in July in Nashville, but we'll see how the world works. If we can't have it in person, we'll do some virtual uh, version of that. Um, but you know, obviously our, our first choice would be to have it in, in person. And as I mentioned before, Jonathan Dix has just joined our, our board. So if you are interested in fundraising for Sierra and you can reach out to him. Next slide, Karen. Family support is uh, headed up by Jen Wyman. We have a lot of different uh, resources available for families. You can check out our website, it's at stenosis.org, and you can see a lot of those different, uh, different resources we have. Next slide, Karen. Education and awareness. Typically, uh, we'll be exhibiting at uh, professional conferences and getting the word out to professionals about cystinosis and educating. Uh, the world's been a little bit different this year, and we haven't been able to attend lots of the conferences that we typically do. But uh, you know, we hope in the future we will be able to. We, we continue to have information for professionals on our website, and uh, you know, we have reach out all the time from uh, professionals who are data who are uh, <coughs> treating cystinosis individuals around the world. And we continue to support them. So next slide. And then finally, let me just uh, touch on the fact that we've added an adult leadership advisory board to our board. Um, it's a group of adults with cystinosis who've uh, expressed an interest in becoming um, experts in advocacy and, and advocating on their own behalf for cystinosis. Um, we've had a variety of individuals with, with cystinosis on our board over the years, but this is a board that's expressly um, focused on the needs of adults, and, and they have a variety of um, initiatives that are really interesting, and we've had some really great individuals um, take part and, and really um, work towards creating a better future for, for everyone living with cystinosis. So with that, I'll leave it to Dr. Grimm and, and Fernanda, and, and thank you, Carrie, um, for organizing this uh, session tonight for us, and um, I thank everyone for joining. Yeah, and I just want to do a little bit of a shout out for the A Lab. Um, they actually opened up applications just yesterday for they're looking for new members. So if you are an adult with cystinosis or if you know of adults with cystinosis who want to take a more active role in leadership within CRN, uh, go to cystinosis.org slash A Lab, I think it is, Christy. I'm not sure of the website URL, but it's, I know it's on the drop down and uh, take a look at that. So, um, that being said, Dr. Grimm, I'm excited to bring you on. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and allow you to share and kind of take it from here. Okay, Again, well, if you guys you. have any questions, please post them in the chat and I will feed them to Dr. Grimm and Fernanda. Well, thank you very much. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to uh, speak to all these families and people who are affected in some way or another uh, with cystinosis. And, and I've had a chance to uh, meet Fernanda and learn more about Abrobio. And that's not a name that's familiar to a lot of the cystinosis community, uh, but they're the ones that have really committed to taking the gene therapy to the individual patients. So, you know, you've got your research, which establishes it safety <clears throat> and efficacy, but actually getting it to the patients is gonna be the responsibility of AvroBio. So I just really want everybody to welcome them. I'm looking forward to Fernanda's talk. So Fernanda and I have set it up. So I'm gonna give a little introduction, uh, sort of set the stage for why the stem cell therapy is necessary. Then Fernanda is gonna uh, uh, speak about the current processes and the organization and how the stem cell therapy actually happens. And then I'm going to take uh, back the last little bit of the presentation and talk about where we see this going in the next few years and some other offshoots of stem cell therapy. So to get started, I'm going to see if I can properly um, <clears throat> share my screen. So I'm asking to share my screen and Share. There we go. So, Perfect. okay. So, are you seeing like I'm seeing in front of me the the drop down of the uh, panel? No, 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 you're perfect. All we see is your screen. Your uh, 
Excellent, so I can move this out of the way here. Okay, so um, next slide. Let's see if it works. There we go. So cystinosis is a disease of the lysosomes and the lysosomes are thousands of little bodies inside each cell and they serve as recycling plants. So when your cells are working and your body is working, <clears throat> proteins break down and chemicals break down and they need to be recycled. And so the lysosomes take damaged proteins in and they break them, break them down to their amino acids and then they pump them out so the body can reuse them. And so in this situation here, we've got uh, the truck leaving the recycling factory with a whole bunch of paper to be reused. And that's great, that's how it's supposed to work. But in cystinosis, it's like the paper truckers have gone on strike. So they're not trucking paper away from the, uh, from the recycling plant, yet the front office keeps accepting deliveries and more deliveries. And it's so much so that the whole recycling plant's filling up with paper, you can't even move your truck and then something goes wrong. And that's such a great analogy about what cystinosis is because the cysteine builds up inside the lysosomes and fills up the lysosomes so that there's no room for anything else to happen and they die and then the, those lysosomes release their contents of crystals to the cells and then the cells die so and here we've got a little cartoon uh, which shows cysteine uh, inside the lysosomes and there's a protein here called cystinosin and the job of cystinosin is to pump the cysteine out of the lysosome. Beautiful. Well, what happens if the cystinosin protein doesn't work because of a genetic abnormality, or you've got the 57 kilobase deletion, so the protein isn't there at all? Well, without the protein to pump cysteine out of the cell, cysteine builds up and builds up and leads to damage. And that causes the damage that we see in cystinosis. And so these are pictures that you've probably seen before of cells in various tissues in the body, kidney, bone marrow, liver, and even the brain, there's cysteine crystals causing damage. So life-changing drugs can be. And a life-changing drug is cysteamine. And that's available at Cystagon, or the delayed release version ProSysB. So when you take cystiamine, which hopefully you are regularly, if you have cystinosis, um, a lot of it gets destroyed by the liver, but what does get into your blood then goes into the cells, and then it gets in the cells and it goes into the lysosomes. So here we've got a cartoon of a lysosome that's just chock full of cysteine in the cystinosis patient. The cystiamine gets into the lysosome grabs a cysteine, and then it tricks one of the other pumps to pump it out. So then the cysteamine keeps pumping out the cysteine and depletes the cysteine from the lysosomes and makes you healthy again. And that's how cysteamine works. And we know it makes a difference for people. This slide is from uh, a study which looked at patients' kidney function. So on the x-axis down here, I think you can see my pointer. That's age and years. And on the y-axis, this is kidney function. Now in this group, this is patients who never ever saw cystiamine, no cystagon, no prosysbe. And by age 10 years old, these children are either dead or on dialysis or have had a kidney transplant. Now with some cystiamine treatments, say they got started when they were older or they couldn't tolerate it very well, so they only got some, you can see many of these people, their kidney function is preserved. They got 40%, 50% kidney function in their teens. And in patients who got adequate treatment, they were able to tolerate their cystiamine. They got started at a, at a young age. Their kidney function is preserved even better. So there's no doubt cystiamine protects your kidneys. It delays the progress of kidney failure. Well, back in the 60s and 70s, people thought that kidneys were the only problem. But as patients started living longer, we realized that in addition to kidney failure, there was muscle problems, trouble with swallowing, uh, blindness, damage to the various endocrine organs like the male gonads and the pancreas and central nervous system problems. And if anyone has been to any presentation on cystinosis in the last 
20 years, you've seen a slide or something like this showing a patient who has really lack of muscles here and you can see how slender this person is. But the hand, the indentation in the muscles between the thumb and the index finger, that's the first place that we see the myopathy in most patients with cystinosis. Taking cystiamine is hard, and it's especially hard for teenagers. And studies have shown that for cystiamine, Procisbe, Cystagon, and other drugs, teenagers don't take their meds the way they're supposed to. And in this one study, it showed if you're under 11 years of age, close to 90% of kids took all four doses of Cystagon, but only half of teenagers did. And many teenagers took only three or two or one doses. So in my practice, I see that there are some families where the patients are lucky. There's a second child born to a family with cystinosis, so they were diagnosed at birth and started right away or a child's able to tolerate the cystiamine. Some of these kids have uh, iron stomachs and some don't. Or there's a family where there's a parent that's able to devote their time to their kids to make sure they get their medications. There's not too much teenage rebellion. Friends who understand and accept the cystiamine odor. So there's a hell of a lot of luck with having good therapy with cystiamine and having good outcomes with cystinosis. And I hate relying on luck. But as we're doing more research, and this is research done by Sergio Katz, um, cystinosin, the protein which is damaged or absent in, cyst in cystinosis, it doesn't just pump cysteine out of the lysosome. It has a bunch of other functions. It's involved in controlling the supply of amino acids to the cell. It's involved in signaling about the oxidation stress in the cell, and it and it, it's also involved in controlling things like chaperone-mediated autophagy. So the data shows that one of the most important sets of functions is determining how much energy each cell has. And that's run by the TOR, an mTORC complex. And cystinosin actually bumps up against and touches this complex, and so it's involved. And that explains why patients can take all the cystimine they can and do a perfect job, but they still have issues. And there's been studies that have been shown that, that cystinosin um, can have mutations where they still work fine for cysteine transport, but if they don't signal torque, there's problems, including Fanconi syndrome. So this is why the genetics is important, because cystinosin can be damaged at a single amino acid, like here, one of these beads that are colored are, damaged, are areas where there's been damage to the amino acid, or the whole cystinosin protein can be absent. And so your cystinosis in your family may be different than someone else's cystinosis. So you should not compare how your disease is to someone else's, because your disease may be different, because there's all sorts of different uh, mutations that make up the cystinosis family. And genetics matter. And so this is the cartoon showing a carrier father and a carrier mother having children. And you can see that one is unaffected, there are two carriers, and one is affected. And this is classic Mendelian genetics. So understanding the gene of cystinosis allows you to determine whether someone might be a carrier or a homozygous mutation. Like, for example, a common mutation is the 57 kilobase deletion especially which is seen in Northern Europeans, and both your mother and father might have had that, so you're homozygous. Or you could have two different mutations. One might have the 57 kilobase deletion, and one might have a point mutation. Or Dr. Goodyear's doing research on the uh, premature stop codon. But as long as both of your chromosomes, one from your mom, one from your dad, have something wrong, you have cystinosis. So, cystimine therapy is great. It's life uh, saving, it keeps you healthy, but it's not perfect. And so that's where looking at genetics and trying to rewrite the damaged gene came in. Now, it's Dr. Stephanie Shirky, who was at Scripps and is now at UCSD, uh, has done a lot of research with a mouse that has cystinosis. And there's our little, little mouse. And what they found was they could take a lentivirus vector, which is a virus that has been made safe and loaded up with a healthy copy of the mouse cystinosis gene and injected into that mouse. And since they've got lots of identical mice, uh, they can study very closely what happens. And you can really improve or cure the cystinosis in those mice.
And one of the things that was so groundbreaking in this research was it turns out that if you have uh, cystinosis cells uh, that have been replaced by the stem cells from the mouse, they make these things called macrophages. And the macrophages start going out into the mouse and actually finding sick cells. And here, this is a picture of a kidney tubule, which has got cystinosis. And they're actually injecting into that kidney tubular cell healthy lysosomes. And they're sucking up the damaged lysosomes. So they go around actually helping out, sort of providing first aid. So we thought, you know, a stem cell transplant could really help cystinosis patients. And back in 2018, the first paper that reported a stem cell transplant in a cystinosis patient was reported. Now, uh, cystinosis, uh, in this situation, this patient got a uh, stem cell transplant from an unrelated donor. It was a fully matched unrelated donor. And this was a 16-year-old patient who received his stem cell transplant in Europe. And uh, he had stem cystiamine toxicity, so he got the transplant. And they were able to show within a few months that his kidney function stabilized, that his polyuria, the high urine uh, fluid production resolved, and his problem with light exposure, he, was, he lost his photophobia. And biopsies of his stomach showed the crystals that were there before left. So there was clear evidence that the stem cell transplant was working. But unfortunately, he succumbed to side effects of a stem cell transplant. So although the, the stem cell transplant worked by day 22, he developed something called graft-versus-host disease. And that graft-versus-host disease caused infections, including adenovirus and parvovirus. He had a brain injury. He got a salvage stem cell transplant. He, his kidneys failed. He developed pneumonia and death. So an allogeneic stem cell transplant is quite risky with lots of toxicity. So we don't want to go down that route. So going back to Dr. Shirky's research, what they did was they took the gene and put it back into the mice and they didn't have graft versus host disease. So why can't we do that in humans? So what they did was they got a human lentivirus vector and prepared human cystinosin um, gene and are doing a study where they take a patient with cystinosis, they take out the patient's own cells, the cells go to the lab and they are corrected by the, by the vector in the lab then those cells are frozen. Then the patient gets a modified amount of chemotherapy that kills some of the stem cells to make room. Then they get the stem cells infused back into them and hopefully that will cure the disease. And that is the approach that AvroBio has been working with um, Dr. Shirky to get. And now uh, I'm going to uh, turn over the next part of the conversation to uh, uh, Fernanda Copeland from AvroBio, but I just thought it's always good to have a thought for the day to wake people up. So, <laughs> Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Last night I killed a politician. And the priest says, tut, tut, my daughter, I'm here to listen to your sins, not your community service work. <laughs> Okay, I'm stopping sharing and take, giving it back to Carrie and Fernanda for the next part of, this, of the, of the presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, real quick, Fernanda, before you start, uh, Dr. Grimm, we did have a question come through, which I think is appropriate based on what you just shared, that if you could go mind answering. Um, have there been any publication or correlations observed for the age of start of cystiamine and kidney failure? So I will answer that question when I get the screen back. Uh, because that's part of the presentation, which focuses on when we might want these patients to get their stem cell transplant. So hold that thought. Okay. I've got it for you. All right. All right. Fernanda, are you ready to go? I am. What an exciting conversation. This is so much fun. Um, so uh, I will share my screen. I want to thank uh, Carrie. You've been wonderful. And the Cystinosis Research Network. Um, have been so welcoming to us, uh, to the cystinosis community. Um, all right. There you go. Perfect. 
Uh, yes, you have been so welcoming to us. Uh, thank you, Christy and Clinton and everybody. Uh, my name is Fernanda Copeland and, and I lead the patient advocacy function uh, here at AvroBio. Um, some of you may know that I'm a dietitian, so I started my career working with patients and families, uh, helping people manage uh, their diseases, a little bit of work uh, with people who needed medical nutrition therapy and managing a kidney uh, condition. So I understand the delicate balance about potassium and sodium and fluids and protein. So I have a great appreciation for everybody who works on that. Um, I want, as, as uh, Professor Grimm was saying, uh, our, our studies are still investigational. So I want to remind everybody that it has not been approved by the FDA or any regulatory agencies. And the researchers are still evaluating the safety and efficacy in clinical trials. Uh, my brief presentation today, uh, I will talk about who is AvroBio, some basics of gene therapy, um, the AvroBio process for lentiviral gene therapy, our platform called PLATO, and uh, a very brief introduction to the study that Dr. Shirky is conducting right now. And then I will turn it over to uh, Paul and we'll have questions. I also want to acknowledge uh, many of my AvroBio colleagues who are on the call. Uh, I will uh, be sharing uh, the team, the program team later today. Uh, so AvroBio is a clinical stage lentiviral gene therapy company uh, working to develop uh, one once in a lifetime uh, therapies, gene therapies to reverse or halt uh, lysosomal disorders in a single dose. The company is celebrating its fifth anniversary this year. We were founded in 2015. We currently have five programs in the lysosomal um, disorders, about 130 employees so far, and our headquarters is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We also have an office in Toronto. And the picture that you see on the right is from earlier this year when we were celebrating Rare Disease Day. Um, just a few days before our offices closed because of COVID-19. Uh, Rare Disease Day as well as uh, Cystinosis Day are very important and celebratory days for us at AvroBio. Uh, the company has developed a strong lysosomal disorder uh, franchise pipeline with five programs, Fabre being our most advanced program where we have treated uh, so far nine patients. A total of 12 patients have been dosed with the gene therapy. Cystinosis is the second program that is most advanced that has treated two patients so far in the investigator-led study with uh, Dr. Shirky at UCSD. I also want to say uh, that we're still very early. And so we really appreciate the invitation to come and share. And the company has been very uh, open to sharing our progress um, as we continue to advance our programs for cystinosis. So if we think a little bit about gene therapy, the human body has trillions of cells and most of these cells have a nucleus. And inside the nucleus, uh, we each of us have 23 pairs of chromosomes, one that we get from our mom and one that we get from our dad. And these chromosomes are made out of DNA. The DNA is the hered hereditary material that carries uh, the person's unique genetic code. A section of the DNA is the gene that you see on the right. Um, and then the gene has instructions on how to make proteins that the body needs. Examples of some proteins are enzymes or antibodies. In the case of cystinosis, we're talking about cystinosin, which is a, mem a membrane transporter protein. So in a normal gene, when a protein is produced, a copy of the DNA is made into what it's called mRNA. And then this mRNA 
uh, we'll go to the manufacturing part of the cell and and there the information is read and then it's assembled into amino acids these amino acids need to be folded in a very specific way in order for these proteins to be made just like very much like a key and a lock must be very specific for this to work properly but when there is a mutation or a variation in a gene uh, it causes the, the gene not to make proper protein or a missing protein in the case of cystinosis, for example, leading to uh, cysteine to be accumulated in the lysosomes. So what gene therapy is, it's a technique that uses genetic material, whether it's when we talk about genetic material, we're talking about DNA or RNA uh, to transfer. It's the technique that uses genetic material for the treatment, long-term treatment or potential cure of genetic disorders. So what happens in gene therapy is the transfer of a therapeutic gene, also called a transgene. As we continue this conversation in the future, uh, there is going to be a lot of, uh, an array of terms, gene therapy terms that we'll be referring to. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm making an attempt to explain and, and give synonyms. So we call the transgene or therapeutic gene, the gene that is going to be used to be inserted into the person's cells to augment and, and cause that cell to be able to restore proper cellular function. So what you see here on the left is uh, what we call an expression cassette. And the expression cassette, uh, the transgene or the tra therapeutic gene is inserted into this expression cassette. And this expression cassette also has a promoter, which we also call a, a switch motor that is on and off or a little that drives the production of the protein. Uh, this expression cassette is then transferred in a vector, which you see right here. And then this vector is transferred to the person's cell. Once the vector is inside, goes into culture with the person's cells, the, the vector will uncoat and then the therapeutic gene will enter the nucleus and start making the proper, the functional protein. Um, so here is the process or the experience of what a person could expect. And I will go explain step by step. The first step in the gene therapy is that the person will receive a medication that will stimulate the, uh, the bone marrow to release uh, cells, stem cells into the blood. These cells will be collected and they will go through a, a process called apheresis, where the cells that have the CD34 marker on the surface will be isolated. And these are the cells that we want for the gene therapy. These CD34 cells are also what we call undifferentiated cells, or I like to call them generic cells. These cells will give rise to all daughter cells in the future that will become specialized. And that's why we want these cells. Uh, once we, we, we have these cells and then they will go uh, into culture with the vector, uh, the lentiviral vector that we talked about, and then a function and copy of the gene or the transgene uh, will be uh, going to culture with the vector. And then these, these cells will go through a test of, of a lot of tests to make sure that we have the drug product or the transduced cells is the drug product. product. They, uh, they'll go through a battery of tests to make sure that we have the drug product that we want. And then they will be frozen, also called cryopreserved, and shipped to the patient to receive a one-time infusion or a one-time gene therapy dose. There is a step to help the patient get ready for the gene therapy, which is called conditioning. 
conditioning is a step that prepares the body to receive the gene modified cells. The process, what happens is that it, uh, the, the person will receive a medication called busulfan, which is a medication that is used to create space in the bone marrow, which enables the new gene modified cells to engraft or take hold uh, in the bone marrow once introduced into the patient. Conditioning is an important step and it's also a personalized medicine. So the amount of medication, and I saw a question come in, is the amount of medication given to a person will depend on somebody's metabolism and somebody's weight, for example, and how fast somebody metabolizes a medication. Um, that, that dose itself, it's measured several times during the day to ensure that the person is receiving the optimal amount of medication to ensure that these gene modified cells will engraft and take hold and occupy space in the bone marrow. Once in the body, once in the body, uh, these cells are designed to restore the normal cysteine recycling mechanism that Professor Grimm was saying. Um, cystinosing is, is, a, is, a, is a protein that is missing uh, in, with patients with cystinosis. All, in all cells of the body, they lack this cystinosing protein. So like uh, Professor Paul was saying, uh, there is a variety of mechanisms and uh, a variety of ways that cystinosing acts in the body and that is beyond just removing the cystinosing outside of the lysosome. What you see on the left is a normal lysosome that has uh, the cystinosing transporter membrane protein excreting the cystinosing. What you see on the right is a lysosome that has cystinosis where the crystals you can see in the middle and they can't get out. But with gene therapy, the cystinosing is transported by a variety of different mechanisms, including these nanotubules that you see on the bottom, and including these exosomes that are able to find the cells that uh, have cystinosis in order to be able to excrete the cystinosing from inside the cell to outside the cell. Uh, it also enables uh, gene therapy to be available in many systems of the body, including the central nervous system, and then all the other organs that are affected by cystinosis. It's almost like it's a natural factory that is, mimics the natural production of cystinosing in the body. Um, Plato, which you will continue to hear more, is what Avrobio, is Avrobio's um, proprietary gene therapy platform. This gene therapy platform includes the state-of-the-art vector. Vector is what we use to transfer the transgene into the cells. There is the personalized conditioning, which is what I mentioned about everybody having the right exact those of conditioning, as well as automated manufacturing. What you see here on the left are the machines that, uh, that prepare the transduced cells. And what this automated manufacturing allows is for us to be able to scale up and work to have uh, gene therapy available for as many people as possible in the future. A brief introduction to Avrobio uh, cystinosis program. Um, it's again, it's investigational, so it hasn't been approved by any regulatory agencies and it's still being evaluating for its safety and efficacy in clinical trials. Um, there is currently an open uh, clinical trial for cystinosis gene therapy being conducted at UCSD by Dr. Stephanie Sharkey. This is a phase one, two investigator sponsored trial evaluating the safety and tolerability of AVRRD04 or the gene therapy for cystinosis. 
uh, a total of six patients between adults and adolescents uh, will be enrolled. So far, two participants have received gene therapy, uh, and it includes males and females. And uh, for males and females participants who are currently on uh, the cysteamine therapy and the eye drops. Uh, it's currently uh, enrolling. So in summary, uh, lentiviral gene therapy is still investigational. Uh, PLATO is a Robio's proprietary uh, gene therapy platform that is developing uh, the gene therapy for cystinosis. And the person who's interested in learning more about AVRRD04 should discuss it with their doctor. I also put uh, the clinical trial identifier number if you are interested in learning more about the study and you wanted to take notes. And last but not least, I want to thank uh, the community and the patients and the advocacy leaders for uh, allowing us to share and for joining us today. Uh, our team at AvroBio, our cystinosis team at AvroBio are a, a passionate and dedicated group of individuals and I'm so proud to share uh, their names uh, of everybody who's working on the team with you today. Uh, so thank you so much for allowing me to share and uh, I welcome uh, questions and uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Fernanda. It's so exciting to see that there's like truly tangible hope on the horizon for you know, the cystinosis family. So uh, Paula, would you mind kind of wrapping us up and bringing us full circle? Sure. Um, so if uh, Fernanda, if you would stop sharing your screen, then I will share my screen again and see. <clears throat> All right. So, for the day. <laughs> okay. So moving on. So what families are uh, most interested in is timing. When is it actually going to happen? And what happens to these patients? So this is sort of the the 40,000 foot view of what happens to a, an individual person in um, getting this gene therapy. So here for the study, for a, for a patient around three months before, the plan was to stop the eye drops. Two months before you come in and get your stem cells mobilized. So that's really just a couple of big IVs going into your arm and then a machine does phoresis to remove the stem cells from your bloodstream. Uh, so it doesn't, it's not a surgery or anything like that for most people. About three weeks before the transplant, you stop your oral cysteamine. Five days before the transplant, that's when you get your conditioning and that's the busulfan. Now, there was a question in the chat. Someone said, well, you know, what about if a cystinosis patient is kind of sick, you know, would people be able to tolerate chemotherapy? I think you have to think about this chemotherapy from this perspective. There's all sorts of different kinds of chemotherapy. And some people get a stem cell transplant because they have cancer that we haven't been able to fix any other way. So you've got to blast those patients. Very aggressive, multiple kinds of chemotherapy. And that's really hard. This is not that. This is busulfan alone. And it's a much milder form of chemotherapy because you don't need to kill every single stem cell in the body. You just need to make room so that the infused stem cells will find a home because assuming that they're healthier than your own stem cells, they'll elbow their way in. So, so this isn't a huge amount of chemotherapy. Don't, I don't think that's a real big worry. Okay, so you get your chemo day five, your cells are infused day zero. You're in hospital for this time because after your chemotherapy, your white cells are wiped out, your platelets are wiped out, so you're at risk for bleeding and infection. But it's only a couple of weeks. There are other centers doing other gene therapies where they do a very similar process and they kick you out of the hospital to stay in a hotel or stay at home uh, because uh, it's probably safer to be outside of the hospital than in. So this isn't aggressive, aggressive stem cell transplantation. Okay. So, so the plan originally was 
two patients in cohort uh, one, wait three months, two patients in cohort two, have a review, and then do two more patients in cohort three of which they could be teenagers. So that was the plan. And then what happened was we got coronavirus. So the first patient got his transplant and I'm not breaking any confidences, this was publicized. And so he got his transplant in October of 2019. Uh, he's on no cystamine for basically a year. Granulocyte cysteine levels normal. His kidney function has been stabilized. His polyuria is reduced. He was supposed to come back for regular visits, but he couldn't because of a coronavirus. So, uh, but he's doing well. And as uh, uh, Fernanda said, the second patient also received their stem cell transplant and, uh, back in June. So July, August, September, so three and a half months ago and is recovering and doing well. And the third patient has had his stem cells uh, harvested and they're with the uh, gene therapy company uh, and will be coming in if everything goes well in November for his stem cell transplant. So we are three out of the six in process. What's happening in the future? So this is the sort of timeline. So we're here, right here, okay? So the plan was to have a fourth patient here and then a review. And then the fifth and sixth patients would be in later 2021. Uh, uh, and then you need a period of time to observe, to make sure there's no unexpected surprises. So the timeline, we have three more patients who have to be uh, put through this process and six months of waiting. So realistically, the earliest a normal person could expect to receive this treatment outside of a study is the second half of 2022. That's probably realistic. And it might be a little bit faster or slower, and I'd be interested in what Fernanda has to say. Where? People think, am I going to have to move to San Diego? And that's not the hope. You see, the most important thing is the gene correction being done by Avro Bio. The actual care is actually pretty standard. And cystinosis patients aren't a whole lot different than any other patients. So the vision is you would go to your own local children's hospital or adult hospital in your vicinity. So if you had any other need for stem cell transplant, that's where you would go. They would get you prepped. They would make sure you were healthy enough for it. They would take your stem cells and they would send it by FedEx you're trusting FedEx here, uh, to AvroBio. AvroBio would do the cure and then freeze those cells so they're ready and there's a backup. So then you get your chemotherapy that wipes out your bone marrow and you get your corrected cells locally. So you're not gonna have to go to San Diego for this. That's the plan. What about long-term? Well, you know, this is cutting edge and you just don't know what's gonna happen. You know, will there be issues with fertility? Um, and uh, uh can impact fertility. There are people that have gone through this protocol for other genetic diseases who have had babies, uh, but will it affect the males because the male testicular issues, you know, we're just figuring out how males can have children. And so having the busulfan might kill the last few uh, sperm that are in the testicles. So if I had a teenager who was thinking of go undergoing this, I would probably want to do, uh, testicular biopsy and harvesting first, just to be safe. But we just don't know. What about future malignancies or infection? We don't know. We think it's gonna be pretty safe. People always ask, what about the kidneys? If I get my stem cell transplant, how will my kidneys do? Will I need a kidney transplant? So I need to talk about the kidneys for a few minutes. This is my favorite organ. So there you see the kidneys are really protected. They're deep in the back of your body, protected by the ribs and these big muscles because they're really the most important organ, right? So, so the body uh, is, is designed to protect the kidneys. As you get closer to the kidneys, and here's a cut view of the kidneys, and as you go in microscopically, you see that there are, all, there are a million filters called glomeruli. And each filter starts off with a glomerulus, which filters the blood. And then the filtered bl blood goes through processing by the tubules and the tubules reabsorb all the things that gets filtered, but the body needs. And as you know, in cystinosis patients, they're leaking a lot of phosphate, bicarbonate, amino acids, sugar, stuff like that. Now, 
you only are born with about a million filters in each kidney. And the filters you're born with are all you're ever going to have in your lifetime. No mammals make new filters after they're born. And stem cell transplants don't recreate filters. So if the filters are dead, they're dead. Now, kidney tubular injury and death is the first manifestation of cystinosis. So that's where the disease hits first. And so this is a autopsy specimen of a 14 month old who probably had cystinosis. And this was published in 1953. And this slide came from Paul Goodyear. And what they were doing was they were painstakingly dissecting the individual filters from the kidney. These are like the size of a hair. And normal filters, here's the glomerulus and here's the tubules, show lots of cells in the proximal tubule. But in this 14 month old cystinosis patient, the cells were all dead already in the proximal tubule. And so that was why they called it the swan neck deformity, this sort of flexible, almost non-existent neck here. So that's where they call it the swan neck deformity in cystinosis. So by the time most kids are diagnosed with cystinosis at 14 months, there's already substantial damage to the kidneys. So then the question is, even with really good therapy, do you have enough kidney tissue to make it through to old age? And that's really a question because by the time many patients get diagnosed, they already have substantial kidney damage and they may, it may be inevitable that they get kidney failure. So when do we hope that people will be able to get stem cell transplants? Maybe as soon as possible, because the younger you get them, the more likely you are to preserve your kidney tissue. Do we know this is true? Well, there are a few families in the cystinosis community where a second child was born with cystinosis. So the diagnosis was made at the regular age with the first child. They have another baby and they do the testing of the newborn baby and they find that baby has cystinosis. And here's an example. So this is a graphic showing age here up to age 22. And this is kidney function, 100% kidney function and down. This is the first cystinosis patient. You can see the kidney function was deteriorating to about 40% by the time they were about 20, 21 years old. That family had a second child who was diagnosed and cystemine therapy, cystagon and then prosisbe was started within a month of birth. This patient at age 18 had nearly normal kidney function. So early therapy with cystiamine delays or prevents or, or minimizes kidney da damage. So the earlier they're diagnosed and potentially the, the younger the patient, that would be the best target for gene therapy. How soon? There are some diseases where we actually do an in utero stem cell transplant. So I could visualize if you knew you were carrying a baby sometime in the future, we might be able to do the stem cell transplant to the baby in the womb where they're totally protected by the mother. This would be cool. Now, people ask, well, I'm on dialysis or I have reduced kidney function. What about me? So this is for you, this next few slides. So currently the study and gene therapy requires adequate kidney function. That means, and in, this is from the protocol, the subject has a serum creatinine less than twice the upper limit of normal or an estimated creatinine clearance of 50. So if you're on dialysis, if you've got CKD, you wouldn't qualify yet. So what happens there? Well, you're likely gonna need a kidney transplant sooner or later. And kidney transplants are not without problems. So this is uh, my patient and her mom, and they're comparing scars. So this is the living donor kidney removal scar, and this is the implantation of the kidney in this, in this family. And like, so you think of these and you think, wow, this is great. But we as a cystinosis community know the burden of living with a kidney transplant. Drug toxicity. So if you've been on steroids, you know yourself or your child has had all of these things which are steroid related. When you get a kidney transplant, immunosuppressive drugs reduce your ability to fight viruses and protect you from cancer. And after five years, about three or 4% of children who get a kidney transplant will have developed cancer or PTLD. And so you may have friends in the cystinosis community who have had PTLD after their kidney transplant. Unfortunately, many young people 
children and teenagers develop kidney failure after cystinosis. And teenagers have a hard time adhering to all the medications they're supposed to be on, the cystemine therapy and immunosuppressive drugs. And if you look at this slide, the poorest outcome of kidney transplants, and here is 60 months, so five years post-transplant, is this green line. Children aged 11 to 17 who get a deceased donor kidney transplant, this green line here. They have 75% kidney function, uh, so 75% of the kidneys are still functioning at five years, which is much poorer than, the, than any other group. If you look longer, this is 12 year outcome. You look at the group, which are age 12 to 17 at transplant, they have the poorest outcome, except for the elderly who might pass away with a kidney. This is all because of the teenagers' brains. This isn't that they're bad kids. This is just their biology. Their brain is changing. And there are these areas of their brain which they have no control over. So, okay, this is a cartoon. I especially like the, uh, the schoolwork section, which is the smallest section of the brain. I know that for a fact from my teenagers. This is more medical. The deep hormonal emotional limbic system matures by age 15. That's the sex, drugs, rock and roll, excitement, take risks section. The frontal cortex, which is the grown up, are you nuts? Don't do that. You can't do that. You need to get your sleep because you've got an exam tomorrow section. Doesn't really develop till age 25. So this area is so active in those teenagers. And this area doesn't develop for another five or 10 years. And so non-adherence is just a fact of life. And it's so clear that it's actually part of some religious practices. For example, the Amish and some Mennonite communities who are very, very uh, uh, religious, they have a period of time called rumspringa, which lasts around two years for teenagers where they're allowed to do stuff that Amish and Mennonites never do. What happens in Rumspringa stays in Rumspringa. There's the recognition that the brain isn't well developed. So with non-adherence, the reality is we lose a lot of kidney transplants due to non-adherence and people stop taking their cystamine sometimes for five or 10 years. So there are other issues. Now at Stanford Children's, we have a stem cell and kidney transplant protocol, which we have been doing. Uh, we have developed a, as a research basis, but now we're bringing this into clinical practice, a stem cell transplant protocol that nearly completely abolishes the risk of graft versus host disease. We deplete the stem cells of alpha beta T cells. We deplete the stem cells of B cells, which can cause PTLD. So we process these cells from the donor and then can give them to the recipient. Well, what does this matter? Well, after recovery from the stem cell transplant, after three to five months, we are re reviewing the patient. And if the bone marrow has taken, so if they're 100% chimeric, we do a living donor kidney transplant from the same donor who gave the stem cells. So the mom gives the kid the stem cells, the mom gives the kid the kidney. No immunosuppression is needed, period. There is no risk of rejection, period. No risk of PTLD, no risk of cancer, and it doesn't matter if you non-adhere because this is as close as you can get to one and done. There's no countdown to the next transplant because there's no chronic rejection and there's no chronic drug toxicity. So we hope, pray, believe that these kidneys could last a lifetime. And by the way, the stem cells from the parent also correct the cystinosis. We know that from that poor European kid two year, three years ago. So we are offering this to pediatric genetic disease patients right now, and including cystinosis that uh, we are going to offer this to. We uh, do haploidentical or fully matched living donors, maybe unmatched someday. Pre-dialysis or dialysis is acceptable. The three kids that we've done so far all were on dialysis. The only uh, major uh, contraindication is not having donor-specific antibodies. And I've been given permission to show these pictures so uh, this is a little boy after his stem cell transplant from his mother who then got a kidney transplant from his mother. This is a little girl after a stem cell transplant from her father who got her father's kidney. 
We have done a third patient. They are all back at home in different parts of the USA, living well off all immunosuppression. So for those of you who have cystinosis and have a living donor and are getting close to kidney transplant where you could not be a candidate for gene therapy, we are offering this as well as an experimental protocol as something to think about. And the benefits would be self-evident. Anyway, lots of new and interesting and different things in research. Uh, hopefully we'll have some time for questions. Uh, thank you. Definitely for, do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you guys have got quite a few questions. Um, you know, it's, it's really exciting. Um, so these questions are for um, both of you, either of you, however you want to do it. Some of them are brand new. Some of them are kind of clarifying some of the stuff that you guys are talking about. So I'm just going to kind of go through them. Um, this is actually a combination of two questions. Uh, for cystinosis patients that have, a, had a that have had a transplant or have other medical issues, you know, would they be eligible for either the stem cell transplant or the gene therapy? And if not, or if so, you know, what are those qualifications? So the gene therapy uh, can be offered to people who have normal kidney function or a GFR of 50 or better, whether you've had a kidney transplant or not. So if you've had a kidney transplant that's working well, the gene therapy would be an excellent option. Fantastic. So for the stem cell treatment, do you have to get surgery? Can you clarify exactly how that works? Sure. So, uh, the free, so what happens is, is you get a drug uh, uh, that causes your stem cells to be released from your bone marrow, because normally they live in your bone marrow. So you're given a, an injection of this, and then those stem cells are then circulating in your blood. And so you just get a couple of IVs put in your arm, and then the machine washes your blood and purifies the stem cells out and gives you back everything out. So it's just IVs. When you come in for your stem cell transplant, it's just given back as an intravenous. Now, sometimes people have a lot of diarrhea or they might be malnourished and they might need TPN. So they may need surgery for a central line. But it's not like a big surgery with a big incision and a long recovery phase, no. Fernanda? I, th I think what you said is accurate. So regarding the trials themselves, are there going to be trials for younger patients? And also what qualifies as healthy enough? Is, you know, is age one of those issues? So you have to look at it from the perspective of the community. Do you really want to be taking to an experiment a patient who's not very well? who has got a good chance of having side effects. Because if you have even one patient who has a really bad outcome, it's gonna shut down the program. So the leaders of the stem cell trial are looking for the safest, healthiest patients for the trial because they want it to work. Once the trial is done, once it's approved by the FDA, then the, the doctors can the team can take more risks, can take people who aren't quite as healthy, who will be you know, expected to tolerate the chemo and expected to tolerate the couple weeks where your white count might be very low or your platelet count might be very low. But that's something that we're going to have to work out. Uh, now, there are lots of other gene therapies which are getting similar protocols. And again, I'll ask Fernanda if she's got any sense of how sick people can be before they can get a stem cell protocol on some of these other protocols that she's involved with or in general, if she has a sense of that? Um, so we have programs in Fabre, Gaucher, and Cystinosis, and those are the ones that are at the clinic. And, and the same, people, people tend to be fairly healthy uh, to be able to withstand uh, the the conditioning part of the treatment so I think so it's it's accurate what you said there is nothing that prevents uh, people from uh, having other conditions but because they can be exclusion criteria for the studies and because uh, it's a study so it's a very controlled environment where we're trying to minimize the variables so that's why uh, we tend to want to include people who are fairly healthy. Yeah, for now, I've gotten a couple other questions, and maybe you can kind of explain a little bit of the clinical trial process, because people are asking about, 
you know, rolling it out beyond different sites, getting it worldwide. Can you just kind of explain the phase yeah. one, phase two, what that means to go into yeah, phase two? Yeah, I can definitely give more information about that. So, so right now, you know that there is a phase one, two that is currently rolling at UCSD by Dr. Shirky. And that trial has a goal to enroll up to six people. So far, two people have been treated with that. Um, so right now we are supporting that trial and we are learning from that trial, which are, for example, the endpoints that we will consider for our future phase two trial. Um, so right now that's a phase one, two, and that's only at UCSD. And then AvroBio is learning. There's a lot of people uh, listening in today and learning uh, from Paul and uh, we speak with patients a lot and we speak with um, uh, thought leaders from all over the world on understanding so we can plan for the future study. And we expect the future study to enroll in several locations um, for sure beyond UCSD. But it's very early still, so we're still in the planning phase. Uh, so we don't know yet where the sites will be. Um, but we expect, so if you, if you, just to give you an idea, the first patient from Dr. Sharkey enrolled in the third quarter of last year, right? And so there has been two people so far. And so she's enrolling up to six. And so we learned from the phase one, two, so then we can proceed. Uh, if safety and tolerability is achieved, then we can proceed with the phase uh, two, three, or pivotal study. Exactly. And I think it's important for those who are watching who are kind of new to the world of clinical trials to understand that once you get through that phase three, they have to go into the regulatory, you know, deal with the FDA. And it's even if the FDA approves it, that doesn't make it a worldwide drug. It, you know, they're going to have to go through uh, the EMA, which is the European. So it's a really long process because I do notice one of the questions was about getting it worldwide. And that's really just something to follow closely with AvroBio and kind of keep up to speed with what they're working on. It is the intention of the company to absolutely bring uh, this gene therapy to other countries outside the United States. And um, one thing that I learned from a colleague, if you think about when other therapies for cystinosis were approved, if we think about ProSysB, it was probably uh, different countries were approved at different time and it's a stage. So uh, I don't know yet what the country order will be, but uh, if it gets approved, um, then it would be something like that, right? Country by country, with obviously United States being a priority as well as Europe. Exactly, and I think this is where it's important that everybody really stay in touch with, you know, CRN and the, you know the patient groups because they're the ones who are really advocating for this on your behalf. Um, so going back to the trial itself, one of the another questions is why do patients stop high drops so much earlier than oral cystine? So I, I missed that. Um, why do patients stop the eye drops so much earlier than oral cystiamine? I don't know. Uh, I, I was <laughs> part of that. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, let's see. I don't see any, oh, there is one more question, and I think you kind of answered this, Dr. Grimm, but just to clarify, for older patients, does there have to be a certain time frame post-kidney transplant to qualify, besides just monitoring the level? In general, we want about a year to go by for patients to undergo any kind of elective procedure that gives their immune system the ability to sort of accept the new kidney as much as possible. And their immunosuppressive drug dose is down to maintenance. Because if they're going into a big procedure and they're on a higher immunosuppression, like from a fresh transplant, that could increase the risk of toxicity. So I don't know what it will be the final recommendation, but in general, what we recommend is you wait a year for any kind of elective procedure after a kidney transplant. Perfect. Um, are there any other questions? I don't see anything else coming through my chat, but I'm having a little bit of a hiccup. So Dr. if you don't mind just checking your chat to see if anything new has come in. Since so I someone asked for a confirmation. So if you have had a transplant, you can get the stem cells. So. Yes, if you have had a kidney transplant and that kidney's working well, 
you definitely would be able to get the stem cell transplant as far as we know today. Uh, in fact, the criteria for the study was that you had to have a good GFR and a stable kidney transplant drugs. So there may even be kidney transplant patients who are in the study for all we know. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. And I appreciate that. I'm, my chat has frozen on me. So I appreciate Carrie. your help. Hey, Carrie, there is one more question, which is if Wonderful. you're interested in the study, uh, uh, how do I go to qualify? How do I get into the study? So I, there was an Avro Bio email address that I was given for people to contact. Do you have that, Fernanda? Yeah, so the email is, uh, so, so there was, I'm happy to put again the clinicaltrials.gov number. So that's the best way to get information. And then there's also, uh, I can share my screen again. It's patients at avrobio.com. Because this is a study that is, um, because this is an investigator-led study, then what I once I hear from people who are interested in this, I'm trying to put here uh, patients at avrobio.com, then I would connect them with uh, Dr. Sharkey and her team. So that's typically what I do. Uh, that's the email. And then here is the clinical trial uh, identifier number. That's great. I appreciate that. Christy, is there anything that you can share about what CRN is doing, in, you know, to kind of monitor all this and how they can kind of keep up to date with, you know, going through you? Yeah, sure. Of course. So we, um, you know, as many of you know, we publish a, a bi-yearly uh, newsletter and that's available on our website and we mail it out to everyone on our mailing list. We try to do a, a summary of, of research that we know of. Um, any kind of uh, trial that's advertising for, for patients, we'll have information there. Um, and then we have periodic uh, updates, you know, via our Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Um, and then obviously our website and our, and our closed Facebook groups where we, we, you know, try to keep everybody updated on what's going on in the, the world of cystinosis, you know, whether it has to do with CRN or not, we try to keep up uh, on a sort of a general basis. So, um, if you don't already, follow us on all of those all those channels and get on our, our mailing address and we'll keep you updated. Well, I, I want to thank Dr. Graham and Fernanda for probably our most popular topic tonight. Um, and thank you to all the families and our attendees who joined us this evening and helping us conclude the 2020 virtual meetup series. Um, it was a quick change from the three we had planned in person and Christy and our team just turned on a dime to get these going. So I wanted to thank Christy and the CRN and the assistant nurses community for allowing me to continue to be a part of this for the last five, six years. Um, Dr. Graham, Fernandez, is there anything you want to share before we let everybody go for the evening? Get out and vote. <laughs> <laughs> Fernanda? No, thanks everybody. I thank you for allowing to share. It's great. All right. Anything, let me know. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. This video will be available online in the coming weeks. Uh, keep up with CRN. They'll let you know when it is available. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or Christy, and we'll be able to get those answered for you. Have a good evening, everybody. Okay. Thanks, everyone.